Okay, how does this work? Big green arrow. Yes. <clears throat> uh, hello, thank you for that introduction. Um, also, thank you, uh, Case Penny, uh, for organizing the conference. And I especially want to thank uh, John Friedman for that keynote address. It was um, deeply moving, I felt, and uh, beautifully written and read. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to present today's uh, work done uh, by me and also by my students um, in Chandigarh. We spent a semester, um, last semester there, um, and over the seven visits I've made to that city, which I assume a quite familiar city to this audience, um, I became quite interested in the, the, the kind of peripheral regions of the city which were unplanned and which are actually planned as a, in a kind of de facto non-planning way by the initial diagram of the city uh, and the fact that those are urbanizing very quickly and very differently than the, the kind of masterful uh, mega block plan of, of Le Corbusier. And there's very interesting things happening out there. What you see behind me is a plan of uh, roughly 50,000 people, a uh, resettlement colony that's currently under construction. Um, and I'm very interested in this as you can tell from the title, this extremely simple form of urbanism uh, that's built around courtyards and checkerboard patterns of fronts and sides of double loaded corridors, highly efficient one and two room buildings or uh, units. Uh, this, the plan in front of us, Maloa, is two room uh, units. The one we did a lot of work on uh, called Danas is uh, one room units. Um, I want to look at this and argue, in fact, that there's something perhaps mortifying to us and with our first world problems in a city like Vancouver. Um, to look at a plan like this again, I, I noticed in our last presenters, uh, Pruitt Igo and uh, the unbuilt plan for Vancouver, a similar plan making strategy, but actually very different. And uh, we'll get into how different it is uh, as we get into the, the work here. But, um, I'd like to, to argue, I guess, that these very simple forms of urbanism, um, actually, if they're well designed in their fundamental element, which is this unit of four that wrap a courtyard, might actually, and, and if there's a certain back and forth exchange between the inhabitants and the bureaucracies that administer them, there may be something there that's quite useful for us in the West, not only for our own planning processes, which tend to be dictated in democracies by extremely narrow-minded interest groups in neighborhoods, on uh, my view, um, as we start to absorb populations of migrants, um, currently 25,000 in Canada, many of them housed in hotel rooms, um, and how we deal with those things, let alone glo uh, globally. Um, <clears throat> so here's the plan. Here are a few questions. Um, questions I think I've basically covered. Um, there's nothing really more to say about them. I think these are open questions. They're not questions that are research questions, certainly not yet, and nor do I claim that what I'm going to show you is research. It's simply a first pass at a series of questions that actually uh, will be more deeply dug into in the coming years. <clears throat> um, so here's Shandigar. Uh, most of us, I'm sure, are familiar with this plan. This plan of um, sectors uh, arranged around the the system of V's hierarchically to distribute um, efficiently circulation, uh, uh, but also, you know, unfortunately, higher, uh, it, 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 it introduced this high, very hierarchical parcelization um, strategy so that in the north, let's see, point there. The, the northern sectors at the top of the plan uh, are very large plots, some of them an acre. As you move south, um, the plots get smaller. So it essentially reinforced all the worst and anti-modern traditions of India. Um, but it also reinforced it by not, in a typical functionalist methods, a highly exclusive uh, idea about what cities are made out of, which is they're made out of residential space and industrial space and commercial space and circulation and there was no accommodation in other words for the the, the huge um, class of people who make cities work which are the working poor and I mean we've seen it in other slums in India and this city built its slums around its blind spot 
its slums came to exist because there was a huge population of people that weren't in any way accounted for. And they started to settle as opportunistic people in a democracy will around the edges as near as possible to their places of work, the university, the, the actual construction of the capital complex and its famous monuments uh, in the, the industrial zone along the edges. Um, so very quickly, a city of, of many, many thousands of people, 30,000 just to build the capital complex arose. Uh, that population today has swelled to something around a half a million, uh, which to the credit of the city, it has um, housed and it is methodically um, uh, we can debate the top-down versus bottom-up. In fact, I would like to debate that um, with the pre presenter on Quito, these bottom-up processes. I think they're problematic. I think they're deeply insufficient to deal with the scales of migration that are happening. Um, they work in a kind of boutique way, but they don't deal with, you know, India's, the fact that India is going to have 400 million people move to cities in the next 35 years. Um, so, how do we deal with the population of North America? I don't think we deal with it from long community planning processes. Uh, here's a plan showing the location of the slums uh, that came up in the city from, you know, 1960 through the 70s, and it wasn't until about 75 um, that the city actually started to uh, develop a policy around resettling people. The policy took the form of roughly um, 30 colonies housing roughly 200,000 people. And what they did was they cleared slums, moved people into a whole series of typologies. Um, you have tenements. Oops. Um, the tenements are really buildings, uh, which were obviously the most fully formed of the, the, the recent settlement colony types, down to sites and services. Uh, to bear houses, to bear sites. Bear sites basically create a platting network or, or gridiron generally with roads, no services, uh, centralized uh, plumbing services, no electricity, no really anything uh, except for a piece of land which was leased to an owner, which the problem with all of these in the early years was that uh, because you can, um, because you're, if you're a family and you're used to living in a, a hovel, um, what would you rather do? Move back to that hovel and have the income from uh, subletting your place? Um, the answer to that, more often than you might guess, uh, was yes. So, so d they built uh, housing for 200,000 people, but only, say, 50% of those people chose to live on those plots. They actually leased them, made money, created new slums. So the city was faced by about 2005 with the problem of um, and it produced, this is Sector 25, um, the last on the page here. Um, this is a bare site scheme. So this basically city, people came and built uh, these mostly three-story buildings, uh, very small plots. We're talking about roughly three, three meters by seven meters in dimension. So the circulation you see, those aren't, that actually isn't circulation, it's storage. It's a stealing of the street, the public space, and it's not a part, it's actually just a way to get more space. So there's very inventive typologies of buildings that you see in these kind of bottom-up building processes, but again, very top-down in terms of resettlement, policing, etc. cetera. Um, anyway, so in 2005, a very different approach came about the city. Uh, a biometrically ID'd every single slum dweller in the city, um, roughly 200,000 people. This is an example of one of the, the, the you see fingerprints, uh, a portrait of the family, a uh, portrait of the, the, the male le household leader, uh, where, they, where people were from, the size of the family, um, where, what they might have done for jobs. So, so they basically built a biometric ID program and used that to say, okay, we're going to house everybody who we've surveyed. Anybody else who comes to Shandigarh can't come. We're closing the city. It's like an episode of Seinfeld where Tuscany is closed, you know. So, like, you can't close Shandigarh. You can't stop migration. But the idea was, okay, we have these 200,000 people. We're going to build housing for 200,000 people now, and that's it. We're done. So, 
What that resulted in, though, was a much more, let's call it, authoritative um, system of housing. You were biometrically ID'd, you were given an ID card, you were obliged to check in on a monthly basis to make sure that you were still living in your unit. And they started to build this uh, much more, <clears throat> instead of a, a, here we'll give you a piece of land, build what you want, they built housing of the sort we saw in the first slide. First they found sites. Um, we're going to look at this site up here, the NOS. And um, again, you can see that it's always in the periphery, always in the edges of the city. So the, it's really not a, it's a taboo subject to talk about uh, migrant people moving integrated into the city. So we can talk about that later if you want to, but for now let's diffuse uh, the issue uh, a little bit. This is the plan, I've got two minutes, so I have to go fast. Um, there's the NOS. Um, these are my students, uh, along with Bindu Dugal, who's a researcher who actually did some of the demographic uh, social uh, surveying uh, programs. She was an instructor with us. Um, we collected data, questions from how many people live in your unit to do you use the courtyards or is it safe? Um, we collected that in this form. Uh, we also then, of course, noticed that modifications were happening to the unit, and that's very important. The, these units, which are extremely simple, have been modified. The modifications, um, initially done simply by families observing the fact that, well, the ceiling's 2.85 meters, that means I can steal two feet out of the top of it and create a whole new storage system, or the width of the room is wider than it needs to be so I can create two rooms. There's a kind of feedback loop with the city. The city said, okay, yeah, we approve that. Go ahead and do that. And that extends not just from the unit itself. Here's a series of examples of modifications. Um, but also to the, to the, you know, there's a, quite a series of questions about the sectional organization of the buildings. If we could create buildings that hovered off the ground so that everybody could live on the second and third floor, that would be perfect, you can see. Um, but also the urbanism. So the courtyards, you know, everything from cricket to seed and, and lentil drying to um, conversations to laundry uh, to parking uh, to many things. Those courtyards actually are starting to be activated also with gardens. Uh, here's a series of images about how people are starting to um, occupy those simple open space uh, fields that exist between the buildings. Um, and then also um, a whole series of public uh, services are starting to emerge. And I, I want to say, so I don't forget, this is often women-led. Um, the fact that there are daycare centers and little dispensaries, doctor's offices, are the product of a series of needs or lacks that were then articulated, expressed to the, um, to the city. The city said, sure, if you want to take that corner unit along that street, oops, and to start to build a market street, or if you want to start to take those corner units and put daycare centers in them, yeah, go ahead, that's a good idea. So there's this wonderful kind of back and forth that's going on between the city. Um, and so, uh, you know, so I think that's this, the back and forthness of it, the simple diagram, which is incomplete, which is, I think, everybody would admit that as a form of urbanism, it is not intended to make a, a kind of microcosm of a city, whether in whatever model, from Camilo, Camilo Cite to the seaside. This is not seaside, this is a diagram. And it's a diagram that's being filled slowly, and it's being filled in a kind of self-esteem, ownership, feedback loop between government and uh, uh, constituencies or residents who using their intelligence and there's a kind of wonderful respect going back and forth. So, you know, here's a picture outside of Calais, the, the French side of the channel um, where 6,000 people are currently living. Um, I think John, Mr. Friedman, quite well expressed the larger scale issues that I'm trying to imply in, in this appeal, I guess. And finally, um, you know, that appeal extends right down to the work I want to thank my students for being involved with. Uh, here's Kamala who uh, ran a little shop and planted this tree and is uh, among the examples of people who are starting to build some 
governance system around this diagram. So the bottom-upness is happening, it's just not happening with the initial proposition of form. And I think that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.